Hi, everyone. Welcome to True You Podcast, a storytelling space for self-discovery, where we use this safe and brave space to address racial trauma and healing for Black women through our own lived experiences. I'm Kelly, and this is my co-host. Hi, I'm Debbie, and we're a mother-daughter team having real conversations about real issues shared by and for Black women because we have something to say. Yes. Hi, everyone. Happy Black History Month. And even though I celebrate uh, Black History Month and recognizing the achievements of Black people, 365 days, but I will say that this month I have been learning a lot through like great programming on TV. So like, for example, it's 50 years of hip hop. And so um, not only like the Grammys recognizing that, but PBS has um a great series called Fight the Power, How Hip Hop Changed the World. And I watched like the first one really good talking like how it intertwines like history and um, and, and hip hop. So I would recommend it if, if you haven't had a chance to uh, watch it. But other than that, um, Ma, how are you feeling today? I'm doing pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm here in Florida and I've been watching a lot of um, programming on fashion. And I don't know if you saw it, it was black fashion last night. And so that was pretty good to be able to catch up on the different styles of fashion all from, from the fifties all the way up until now in the hip hop era. So that's been pretty cool. And that's African-American hip, you know, the half African-American music and fashion. So it's, it's been good. I'm doing real good and I'm enjoying this month, uh, we've been celebrating Black History Month, of course, uh, at the church, we've been having sermons on Black history. So it's been really good. I really enjoyed it today. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like church has been really, um, really good when it comes to like the what the things we've been talking about. But uh, also, um, like I'm sure you're enjoying um, being in Florida as well, as far as the weather, even though like yes. I'm in Illinois, it's not as warm, but um, I'm so happy we're able to still connect through the podcast. And I'm also like very excited about our guest today, um, Aaliyah. We met as coworkers and we soon became great friends. And so I'm so happy that she was able to join us today. Aaliyah, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling pumped. Um, I'd first like to say thank you so much. Kelly, for having me on to the podcast. It's such an honor uh, to be in this space with you and your mom. It's always a pleasure to be in Dallas presence. So thank you. I'm feeling great. Absolutely. And it's a pleasure for us to have you. And um, for the ones listening, I mean, you are in store for a treat, Aaliyah. It's very powerful. And I'm so happy that she is here today because our topic is climate justice and the Black community. And for me, I had very little knowledge about environmental and climate justice and the connection that it has to, to racism. Um, I thought it was uh, a white thing. But uh, what started to open my eyes was a, a, a paper that I wrote in grad school, and that was called The Unbreakable Bond of Capitalism and Racism. And I ended up reading um, a book by Naomi Klein called The Shock Doctrine. And then I, I from there, I did research from Hurricane Tr- Katrina, the Flint, Michigan crisis, and um, Hurricane Harvey. And that is when I learned that um, for the sake of wealth in this country, and even other countries, how Black, Brown, and Indigenous bodies are always disposable. And, and this is true until this day. And so Aaliyah also um, helped me to expand my knowledge when she um, she was, you know, very passionate about, about climate justice. And, and she spearheaded a climate justice peer circle where we worked. And so I ended up reading a book called all we can save, um, which is, I, I want to make sure that I let you know who, who it's by, just in case you want to read it. It's called um, All We Can Save. It's edited by Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and Katherine Wilkinson. And so at this peer circle, we met maybe, it started out, I think, twice a month. Um, and we had like dialogue and we discussed actions we can take in the workplace and in our communities. And it was then that I became aware how big um, the environmental crisis is. And Aaliyah, I am so happy you're here. I know you have a great passion for climate justice and um, just 
want to hear a little bit from you about, can you share what, what started um, this passion? Yeah, so I'll be really honest. I'm pretty late to the game on climate and environmental justice, um, or at least putting a label to yet another structural and systemic form of oppression to be named. It really just provides um, a specific context or an added layer that marginalized groups of people experience. Um, so I'm no expert at it by any means, but I would say I have a few specific contexts myself that facilitated this passion, especially um, as I recognize that even to this day, who are the people that are continuously at the forefront of environmental injustice and who versus who's leading to tackle said issue. So my first couple of understandings of environmental and climate justice really came to the forefront when I was a kid. I traveled on a train throughout the South, the states like Mississippi, Louisiana, Memphis, where my grandmother's from, uh, Texas, uh, with my mom and grandma. And just a day after we left New Orleans, that's when Hurricane Katrina hit. And at the time I was too young to have a phone or access to internet. And my mom and grandmother didn't have any cellular devices either. Um, so our family back at home was really panicking and trying to figure out where we were at and what was going on because they looked at the news and watched in real time the terrifying structural and really social damage that Hurricane Katrina caused uh, when the levees broke and especially the devastating, disproportionate and really lifelong impact it had on black and brown and low income families in the city. And at the time when I was a kid, I didn't really know exactly what was going on, but I knew something wasn't right when I saw mostly black and brown people stranded for help um, on top of their cars and houses and in water. And I just really didn't have a concrete understanding of what was going on, but I just knew it wasn't right. And I couldn't really label that experience at that time. Um, peripherally though, my mom grew up on the South side of Chicago and had a lot of exposure to industrial facilities, few and toxic waste. My siblings and I all had some form of asthma or respiratory sensitivity to air pollutants, both indoor and outdoor. Um, over the past few years, I've been able to have conversations and create art with and support in terms of research and advocacy with other communities in Chicago, like Little Village, to help shut down toxic recycling facilities um, that are disproportionately affecting Latinx community members. Um, on the other side of my family, my father was born and raised in Egypt, and there's significant pollution there, especially in low-income areas where my family lives, um, with piles and piles of garbage and waste, as well as lack of access to clean water. And a common practice that's more privileged, um, a common practice is that there's a lot of um, more privileged countries like the U.S. that will dump their plastics and dump their waste into other countries and literally treating whole communities like they're literally disposable in that way. So that was another aspect of my life on just a different side of my family where I recognized that that was an environmental justice, injustice rather. Um, more personally right now, I currently live near a highway, which means more exposure to diesel, diesel emissions. Um, and to my point earlier, people of color and particularly low income black voices are really not represented enough when it comes to environmental and climate justice advocacy, even though our likelihood of being affected by it is most proximate. Um, so over time, it's just become apparent to me that if our input, like if we treat our environment and each other like crap, to be honest, and that's not to say humans are mutually exclusive from the environment, we're inherently connected to this broader ecosystem, but if we put in crap, we're gonna get crap out, such as an overheated planet that's slowly becoming inhabitable for any life to live. And so I just really got intrigued by the idea of approaching this work intersectionally um, and taking into account all identities, all abilities and perspectives and overlapping systems of oppression because it really does affect all of us literally on a global scale. And it's a way to say, hey, here's how racism sexism, ableism, et cetera, does us all more harm than good. And here's how we can work together to remedy that by giving back to each other, Mother Earth, rebuilding that relationship with land, water, air, and our interpersonal connections, the very things that keep us alive and hopefully thriving. So I just see it as an opportunity to band together and unify us towards this common global goal. Yes. Thank you, Aaliyah. 
That was really good. Thank you, Aaliyah. Um, wow. I think for me, the um, one time that I truly um, was impacted by um, the environmental injustice was, I would say, Hillside in Hillside, Illinois, where they had to end up shutting down the um, that landfill. It, it smelled horrible. Every now and then you can still smell it um, because it has to, I guess, burp up air from time to time. And it just it's just horrible throughout the whole area. But that was my first interaction. The second one, of course, was uh, Flint, Michigan, hearing about that. And then Hurricane Katrina. I had never seen such, it was just horrible seeing people standing on top of buildings and on top of their roof, had nowhere to go because of the le the levee breaking. Um, another instance where I did see a horrible um, area that it's just used as, as you in indicated earlier, as a, a garbage dump was in Burkina Faso. Um, plastic everywhere all i mean it was it was just everywhere they were i i don't think they could figure out a way to to get rid of all of it because it was just so much plastic and that's been one of the things that i know i've been trying to do is recycle make sure that i do my small part but it in burkina fossil was just horrible um just how they just threw out plastic everywhere um, but I, I have a question for you, Aaliyah. Uh, just want to take a step back and see if you can, can you uh, explain the difference between uh, climate justice and environmental justice? Yeah, absolutely. So I also would say that these two issues are not mutually exclusive, that maybe as a way to look at it, climate versus environment, climate is more of the long-term effects, almost like in the body, we have like hormones versus neurotransmitters and hormones is kind of longer term over time and neurotransmitters is more, um, I guess, short term. So really, I would just say in general, justice, whether you want to use environment or climate um, in this context is really the inherent right to access safe, clean, and sustainable water, energy, soil, air, food, land, housing, mobility, green spaces, all of that, all environmental factors that guide our lives. And that can really only be achieved through shared power, deep relationship and connection with each other and our surrounding environment, um, where people with lived and living disproportionate experience of um, unclean or unsafe environmental conditions are integrated into all levels of the decision and design making process because we are part of this general ecosystem. So I guess to get a little more granular when it comes to climate equity, there's more of a non-discriminatory focus of allocation of resources um, that protect communities because the climate crisis is already here. So it's kind of almost like the back end sort of uh, protecting the need to protect communities and have them be in a resilient space because our climate is changing over time. Whereas environmental justice, that's more of the way our built environment, our structures that we've put in place like toxic sites and facilities have facilitated unjust treatment of communities such as being exposed to toxic pollutants. Um, so one is real, I mean, they're both interconnected really, but I would say that climate is kind of the, climate justice rather, is kind of the um, long-term sort of uh, vision, I guess, when it comes to the way our built environment has been built in the first place and the way it has been affecting these communities disproportionately um, and how that our built environment over time facilitate our climate changing over time. Thank you. Thank you, Aaliyah. That really puts things in perspective and just how, um, how we can think about 
um, about it differently and how, you know, they, how they kind of intertwine. Um, and, and just to see that this is a crisis, which is already, you know, here, it's not, it's not something that's, that's coming. This, this is happening right now every day. Um, we see it every day um, in all over the world. And, and it's, it's multi-layered um, in Black community from, well, not just the Black community, but since we're highlighting the Black community um, from the pollution of the air, the lack of clean water, the lack of green space, food injustice, overconsumption, um, that's that's a, a key thing, and et cetera. And, and Aaliyah, you touched on, on all, all of that. And um, we don't have to go very far. I know, Ma, you talked about um, Burkina Faso, which is Africa, the one of the poorest um, areas in the world, right? Or is it the poorest? I'm not sure. It's the third, yeah, it's the third poorest, yeah. Yeah, so like this is my first time hearing about about the plastic and just to hear that it's, it's happening um, everywhere, but it's also happening right next door, um, like a, a local community of, of Maywood, Illinois, um, they're um, like 30% of the, oh, under the poverty level and they have tainted water. They also have faulty infrastructure, their pipes, they're losing water. I think, Ali, I think, you know, the exact percentage, I think it's 38% or something like that, but they're, they're, they have groundwater, their water is brown, um, it smells, and, and they pay some of the highest taxes and water rates, which is just ridiculous. Um, not to mention that it's, it's also a food desert. So like, we don't have to go very far to see the injustice um, is what I'm trying to say. And so um, Aaliyah, just, just to get like some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, unfortunately, well, for one, we know that Black communities all around the country and the world, for a fact, we are not monoliths. But when it comes to certain systems of oppression, there are some similarities. And unfortunately, Maywood is one of those communities that does experience environmental injustice in this way. Um, and so, as you mentioned, Kelly, I would even argue, and some other definitions of environmental justice might not look at it, but I would argue that things like not having access to healthy food, experiencing food apartheid, that is a structural and systemic way of building such an environment that is more harmful than helpful to the health and bodies of people of color and low income groups. Um, and honestly, if we were growing that type of food in the first place so that they did have access, it would be inherently cleaning up the environment, cleaning up the air because we're using plants to trap the, the gases that make our, uh, make our air so polluted in the first place. So really it is just another structural problem that is not unique to other communities of color really around the country. What I what I find is interesting is that Maywood is really kind of sandwiched between some very prosperous communities. Um, you have Oak Park, you have Bellwood to the to the left, and they are not having those types of problems. And that's that's what I I find it so disheartening that they would be experiencing that. But you're right, um, Ali. I like the idea. Uh, there are a lot of farmers, too, from what I understand, in Maywood. They are raising their own vegetables, and so they're trying to uh, help with that and get the, move away from being a food desert. Um, but thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And so on a flip side, what positive things have you seen or experienced that can help fight against the injustices that are going on not only in Maywood, but uh, Inglewood has the same problems on the South side. Um, what what uh, have you seen? What positive things have you seen that can help fight these injustices? Well, one of the things I would like to point out, um, so I'm, I'm a researcher and I guess now in the work that I do, I um, am really involved in urban planning, but that really what that really means, at least the start of the process, is making sure that the people most affected by these issues are at the forefront of the decision-making process. 
you know, it would not be a problem in the first place of trying to deal with stormwater infrastructure or pollutants in the air if the facility wasn't allowed to be there in the first place. And I'm sure a community wasn't like, hey, yeah, we would love to have this toxic plant in our community. Like that was designed that way in the first place. So one thing I would really say is that I am seeing um, with groups that I've been working with all across the country, urban planners, researchers, artists, um, who are really making sure that marginalized voices are at the center at every single step of the decision-making process of whether or not a facility gets uh, included or whether or not there's going to be healthy food in a place. Um, I won't say something that necessarily bothers me, but um, when you look at redlining maps, for example, and you overlay that with a tree equity score map, which you can, uh, I can share that with uh, viewers. There's something called the tree equity score, uh, as well as the environmental um, protection agency. They have an environmental justice tool um, that you can screen and map your community as well. And with this research, you can find that there's an overlay of redlining communities um, and communities that are more privileged or green-lined, I would say. And so when you ask, well, what, what could be done or what are the positive aspects or what, what I've seen, it's really just, well, what is happening in other communities that are more privileged and wealthy? And how do we get access to that, um, to those same resources that disallow for um, pollution or disallow for any more perpetual harm on our lungs or our, our bodies in general. Um, so one example I've seen, though this is rather um, post-disaster, is in Puerto Rico. Um, I know at least five or six years ago, Puerto Rico experienced a hurricane, but they had a powerful demonstration of interconnectedness where when your entire community has devastated loss of resources, how are you going to come together and prepare for that climate resilience that has to be built in order for your community to move forward? And so they brought together people who were electricians because there was no electricity. They brought together chefs because people needed food. They brought together uh, people who knew how to draw maps to identify where people were at um, who are potentially lost. Um, so really just um, taking a very community-led initiative, and um, I've seen that in a powerful, powerful way. I've also seen um, urban planners and artists um, and people just from all different types of interdisciplinary uh, backgrounds coming together and building, you know, um, bike lanes that are specifically designed by people of color for people of color in California, or um, I've seen black women uh, creating food forests on school campuses so that children know how to grow their own food and have that reclamation of power that we don't need to rely on the built environment stores that are here that don't facilitate our health and we can grow our own food and support our own family. It's literally that reclaim of land, but also reclaim of community and agency. I've also seen people without homes um, underneath freeways who have done guerrilla gardening and building, uh, building literal homes from cob, which is uh, straw, wheat, and mud. And by doing that, they're able to create uh, not only just community, but sustainable infrastructure. Um, that they can live in. And I've seen indigenous people reclaim their land and use it for um, cultural practices. And we know that indigenous people, I know Kelly has probably heard me say this multiple times, but indigenous people globally, um, they only make up 5% of the world's population, but 80% of the world's um, biodiversity, they're able to protect that. And so they have this inherent knowledge of how to keep um, our, our land connected and connected to each other. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities out there from food. And right now I'm um, 
working on so many different projects around health equity in the built environment, building walkability, um, bike lanes and um, accessible paths, walking paths for um, people with disabilities in communities that are low income and where there's people of color, um, looking at healthy food and green space accessibility to affordable housing built from sustainable materials to really just embedding equitable and sustainable practices and policies with uh, municipalities and community members together. Um, because whenever we say policy makers or decision makers, it's always the people who are in, pow in power that have designed those in the first place. But I would argue that policy makers are the people themselves as well, especially those directly affected um, by injustices, whether environmental or not. So. Um, yeah, I've seen a lot of different examples, and it, it is definitely possible to create an environmentally just community and globe. You mentioned uh, homeless people under bridges and um, guerrilla gardening. What is, can you say a little bit more about what that is, guerrilla gardening? Yeah, so um, that is a practice. So there are some groups um, of people who are able to grow food that's a little bit less traditional. Um, it's really the act of gardening um, and raising their own food in a way that they don't necessarily have the legal rights to do, um, because if they're underneath the freeway, it is technically the property of um, the private owners of the freeway, for example, um, because technically it's illegal for them to live there but they're reclaiming that land, reclaiming that space to have um, just equitable access to food um, and taking matters into their own hands to do that just so that they can really survive. But we have monetized land, we have monetized water, we have um, created natural resources in a way that has been privatized when if it's natural, I would argue that it really shouldn't be privatized or monopolized on in the first place. And so um, guerrilla gardening is uh, just one example of a way to reclaim that, um, that legality of privatization of natural resources. Thank you, Aaliyah. I'm learning today. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. Even like I've heard these things before, but just like hearing it again and, and really like processing these things, people are doing some some amazing things in spite of these injustices. I mean, and some just just so they can live, you know, and I think about and we read about this in, in, in uh, when we had our peer circle, just thinking about our ancestors and how they were able to um, till land that they didn't know, you know, but they made it work, built the country on, on um, these resources, really just some great, some, some things to really think about. And um, as we always touch on this podcast, identifying like the trauma, which like there are definitely some traumas when it comes to these injustices, but also there is a need for, for racial healing. And so, um, Aaliyah, like you touched on like the positives of that, but when it comes to um, the community, uh, could you focus on the healing? Um, is there some things you could share about that when it comes to uh, the, the injustice and the, and the racism? Absolutely. Um, so one thing I want to bring up um, that Kelly, you mentioned, we had our peer circle on environmental justice and climate equity with the book, All We Can Save. And I just recall there's one essay that I, I believe it's Leah Penniman. She's one of my favorites. I think she has Soul Fire Farm in New York. And her essay, I believe, was titled Black, titled Black Gold. And that was about the importance of soil. And a couple of things there. One, um, in terms of healing, we can't really heal unless we address the root cause of whatever it is. And I mean that quite literally in terms of the roots, like roots in our soil, in our, uh, in our ecosystem that we can't peel, you know, the leaves of a tree or the trunk of it until we get at the roots and we get at the, the soil that, uh, if the soil is tainted, then, you know, the tree cannot grow and thrive, right? 
And she kind of mentions that in her essay, but also she mentions that a lot of trauma, especially when it comes to the environment, particularly around farming, especially in Black communities, um, there, I believe there's less than like 5% still of Black farmers in this country. Um, and that is problematic, not just in terms of land ownership or stewardship, but it doesn't give us a chance to heal and give back to the earth that has given us life. And so I would encourage people to think about how the air that you breathe, the land that you're on gives back to you and how you could tend and heal the soil um, yourselves and really reclaim that relationship with the earth that we have because we have been traumatized spent for centuries with our connection to land when it comes to slavery and uh, indentured servitude. So really thinking about how we can once again reframe and bring, literally give breath back to ourselves and heal in that way by taking care of the land and making sure that we're taking care of ourselves in that way. Thank you, Aaliyah. That's really powerful. I'm so happy you shared that um, and, and just made it plain. Um, um, and I remember that that poem, it's, it's beautiful. So um, I encourage um, if you have a chance to please check out that book. Um, it has some very, um, it opens your eyes to a lot of things. It really does. Um, and so um, I know we're getting towards the close. I'll pass it to Ma. Thank you, Aaliyah. You have been amazing. We really appreciate you coming on and sharing your heart. I can tell this is something that you really love. And we are so grateful that you came and shared this time with us. We have learned, I know I've learned a lot today. And so that's it for us for today. And we want to thank everyone for listening. And uh, again, thank you, Aaliyah, for giving of your time and, and your gifts. Uh, it is a special gift. And thank you so much for joining us. And blessings by everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Aaliyah. Thank you. True You is brought to you by Radiant Vessels and sponsored by Proviso Partners for Health. Funds for True You, a storytelling space for self-discovery, were received from the Oak Park River Forest Community Foundation.